I'm very glad that I managed to make it to the last 10 minutes or so of the previous session because it also gives me a sense for how different my session is from uh, some of the others. I will apologize in advance because I'm not a governance professional. Uh, so a lot of uh, things that I'm going to say are an outsider's perspective. Uh, so with that caveat, let me get started. Uh, so the wicked problems and are not my invention as a phrase. Uh, they came from um, a Berkeley systems theorist called uh, uh, West Churchman. And the idea was that many of the uh, problems of the 21st century uh, are of a kind where, you know, there are many, many interrelated perspectives. Uh, people agree on some issues, disagree on some issues. Everybody thinks that they are uh, in the right. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, when that happens, um, there's no clear way forward. You can't solve a wicked problem in some uh, obvious sense. And so what it leads to is a system in crisis. So that's the first part of this uh, presentation, right? Um, to give you a sense, actually, um, Historically, India, you could argue, wasn't this kind of system in crisis. Uh, it had many, many other challenges, but not the kind of challenges that we now might call um, uh, systems challenges, right? So for example, the Roman historian Aryan, I mean, so this was somebody living in the early Christian era, but um, talking about Alexander's invasions of uh, most of the known world at that time and including India, right? And so he talks about how in India, you might have people fighting in a field in one, uh, fighting in one corner of a field and the farmer is just going about their business in another corner of the field, right? And so the, the autonomy between the governance class, which at that time would have been warriors and, uh, and kings and others, and the uh, you could say the producer class was quite strong and which is very different from now because now we expect uh, governance to reach every single corner of our society. Um, and so this, um, so as an outsider, one of the things that I look at is how governance is actually of the kind that we understand today is a very new phenomenon, right? It's, it's very new historically for humanity that there is a central institution, the state, who is tasked with ensuring life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. Um, and that it's expected that uh, it will be held accountable for it. So its legitimacy is very deeply tied to its capacity to ensure these kinds of outcomes. That I find uh, a sort of a fresh view for myself that we uh, don't, don't uh, think of governance as something that has been there forever, certainly not in the way that we do it now, right? And um, because of this um, multifaceted nature of governance, it's typically of the elephant kind that we have heard in the famous parable of the seven blind men and the elephant, right? It's actually a Jain uh, story. Uh, so in fact, you can see that, uh, so it says Anekanta, uh, something else, which I'm not going to read right now. So, um, so Anekanta, of course, is the Jain philosophy of multiple views of anything. And so um, it's a very powerful myth of how um, all of us are stuck with our view of a very complex situation, and we don't know how to handle it collectively. And so Socrates is founded to see if we can do something about this kind of collective problem solving, right? And so governance that way is a wicked problem. There are many, many different stakeholders. And I'm assuming again, going back to the previous slide that even people acting in good faith uh, have a limited perspective, right? Everybody sees their view of the world um, and they often conflict not because they are directly in conflict, but because they believe that what one person is seeing, the trunk of the elephant, um, and what another person is seeing, which is the leg of the elephant, are, uh, are seem to be in conflict because the trunk and the elephant are not, and the uh, legs are not the same thing, right? But at the same time, there are, of course, interconnected parts. So the elephant is right there behind everybody, 
Okay, so that's that's how I would like to pose the issue of uh, the wickedness of governance as a problem, right? And what's happening, as especially today with the um, use of you know massive flows of data and information, is that we have kind of a permanent revolution in the uh, enactment of governance. W what do I mean by that? Permanent revolution, by the way, uh, if you haven't heard it, is a famous phrase by Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary. Uh, I'm not saying that um, we are in a communist revolution. It's just that the, the kind of interconnected societies that we are in are constantly changing uh, the way the world is enacted on the ground, right? Um, com uh, compared to the 2000 year ago farmer who could uh, continue his farming <clears throat> despite the fact that there's a war going on, you know, 50 feet away, um, we can't um, ignore the changes that are coming from the rest of the world, whether they are of market uh, origins, whether they are of uh, political origins, whether they are of climate origins, right? Uh, it's a it's the kind of uh, continuous change in our everyday life that is the condition of humanity in the 21st century. So another way of putting it is that there's a permanent crisis that because there's no fixed ground on which we stand and so we have to continuously act from a shaky ground. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because um, it's precisely the change that gives us the opportunity to engineer our own flourishing, right? The, the static world of the past is being replaced by a very dynamic world of today. So, um, so you know, at the same time, uh, IS officer friends of mine will tell me um, that I'm being idealistic and that uh, you need to understand the real situation on the ground. Um, and at the same time, uh, they are, you know, sitting in public policy courses, uh, in, you know, in some institution not too far from where I am right now. Um, and they will um, learn a much more, you could say, normative view of how public policy should be enacted, right? So on the one hand, you have these rational models of the state and of public policy. And on the other hand, you have the very, very messy situation on the ground. And um, it's not clear how to bridge the gap between the two. And again, I should reiterate, I'm not saying I'm a governance professional, but I do see that there is a need for a way of thinking that allows us to uh, bridge the gap between the is and the ought. So when I say is, I mean that the messy situation on the ground and the ought is the kind of flourishing that we would like to uh, see all of us have in the future. Right, and um, I'm going to give a very quick overview of this as a cognitive scientist. So, if you take a look at this picture, I hope everybody can see this picture. Um, and I'm going to let it go for about 10, 15 more seconds. Um, just mark it to yourself, or maybe put a um, message on the chat window when you notice that there's something changing in the picture. So there's actually a pretty dramatic shift. If you, once you notice it, you can't not notice it. Okay, so I'm gonna give the secret away. There's an engine um, under the wing that appears and disappears, right? And if you haven't seen this before, uh, you probably took you a few seconds, if not more, to notice that there is such a big shift in the image. So humans are actually quite bad at um, getting an accurate grasp of the world, right? And it's not that it's not your eyes that aren't functioning; it's the way that you get a gist of a picture and then move along, and so. One of the things that uh, I wanna um, bring as a cognitive scientist is how is it that our minds are uh, predisposed to seeing what we wanna see and therefore how much of the transformation of all our systems, including the governance systems, is about training our minds to see better, right? So it's not training our eyes to see better, but training our minds to see better. <clears throat> 
Okay, and that's what we call by saying uh, when we say wicked problems need wicked minds. Right. So the problems that we have as a society have outpaced our ability to deal with them. Um, and there are many, many interrelated crises that are simultaneously happening, and we have to be able to address all of them. And um, we tend to emphasize individual issues, but not collective issues, right? And, and like the previous slide shows, we are limited by our cognitive habits, right? So we, we think we have a good grasp of the world, but we often don't. And, um, and of course, there are the various challenges that come from complexity. Um, so you have nonlinear path dependent situations. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, by the way, if I'm using jargon that you um, aren't fully aware of, just put a um, <clears throat> question or a comment in the chat window so that I can address that. Okay. So what we need, I think, to uh, assist to create new kinds of systems, right, in a dynamic world. Is what I call learning fast and learning slow. Uh, this is a kind of a cute take on a well-known book now by Dan Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist and economist, uh, whose book was called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. So in his view, there are two kinds of brain or psychology systems that we have. One is a very fast thinking system that responds essentially by gut instinct. And then there's the slow thinking system that is subject to reason and that can be reevaluated and that allows you to um, be more thoughtful. So the question is, how do we do that for organizations and collectives and not for individuals, right? And so that's what I call learning fast and learning slow. So any organization, um, whether it's a government, um, whether it's a government department, whether it's a NGO has to be able to um, act fast. It need, there, are, there is everyday work that needs to be implemented without much thought, otherwise um, you won't be able to function. But at the same time, there should be a slow process of learning how the world is changing and implementing that learning in your work, right? And so I, I feel like learning fast and learning slow is a good model for, for the future. So uh, as opposed to the past where you may not have learning built into the organization at all. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to the next part. And this is where I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of some of the cognitive science um, methods that might be useful. And um, these are what I call mental hooks. So a mental hook is a way of um, grasping the world, right? It's not, so remember that you always want to do something in the world, not just um, stay with the hook, right? So, so let's say you wanna hang a shirt or a coat on a hook. Um, the hook is there for something else. It's for, it has to solve, it has to fulfill its purpose of uh, helping you uh, solve your problem. So it's not an end of in and of itself, but a uh, means to an end. And we need uh, good means to our ends. Uh, so which is to say we need good mental hooks. And um, so what's a mental hook, right? So it's either a model, uh, you know, a mental model is a model of the surrounding world. Uh, so for example, a mental model uh, often uh, within India, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, is that our systems are corrupt. Um, this is a kind of a blanket model that we often use in many, many of our um, everyday interactions. Uh, the contrast to that is a frame. Uh, and a frame is something that you impose on the world. So a model is something that you grasp the world to be. And a frame is something that you impose on the world. So it's really an active versus a passive distinction. And so these are the two kinds of things that I want to very briefly introduce you to. I'm going to keep a view on the time. Okay. Um, now, there are lots and lots of mental models and lots and lots of frames that we use all the time, but you don't want to go with, uh, again, in the learning fast, learning slow mode, you don't want to go into um, unthoughtful and um, potentially even um, wrong 
models and, uh, and frames, right? So what you want is we want to be able to design good hooks that, that get us in the direction that we want to go, okay? And because many of the models are not coherent or wicked enough. So for example, um, let's take the famous corruption model that I just mentioned. Uh, we, we may have a blanket model about how um, everything is corrupt, but not really understand the political economy in which uh, corruption actually uh, flourishes, right? Um, one of the more interesting things I read is there's a recent book by Branko Milanovic. It's called Capitalism Alone, right? And it's talking about how, um, you know, for the first time in human history, there's one economic system that literally spans the entire globe. And, and he says that how in state-dominated capitalism, uh, corruption is actually a very important mechanism through which power is maintained, right? And so it has a structural role and not just a, um, inefficiency or even a moral role. Uh, and I find that a very interesting insight. And so um, we need to be able to therefore to address things like corruption, design better hooks, um, or at least that's what I think. So how do we design better hooks? Um, as I'd mentioned before, hooks are about what you hang on them. So they're not a thing in and of itself. Um, it's a way to make the world uh, more transparent to you. So it's a kind of a cognitive tool that helps you extend your mind, right? And so they're heuristics or thumb rules. They don't have, they're not like the laws of physics or even the, uh, the laws of the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, there are things that you should be able to use and set aside if you if they're not working for you. So they are kind of a low, um, easily replaceable quality to them, right? And we should be able to organize, of course, our own toolkits. And um, the downside, of course, is that if you're stuck on your toolkit, you become the person with the hammer. Um, so everything you start looking at starts um, being something that you can hammer at. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take you through uh, two case studies. So one is a model and one, or actually maybe uh, two models and two frames. So the first model is confirmation bias. Uh, we are all very, very prone to only seeing the things that confirm our existing hunches. And this is something to be very, very wary of, right? And so we pick and choose information that um, suits our narrative. Um, anybody reading uh, newspapers or uh, looking at TV shows or especially being subjected to WhatsApp forwards, uh, you must be seeing how exactly the same incident in the world is being interpreted in, in opposite ways by um, you and your friends. Um, I certainly have that all the time when something happens and a person with one kind of political persuasion says, this is what it really means. And a person with a different political per persuasion will say, no, it's the exact opposite. And that's, be that's typically because of confirmation bias. Um, and that's because we uh, very, very rarely do a comprehensive survey of the facts, right? We only pick the facts that suit our narrative. So that's an example of a, a mental model that's a, usually a deleterious mental model. Uh, and it's important for us to recognize that we are doing it, okay? The second mental model is um, what I call a moral hazard. So a moral hazard is a situation where you, let's say as a decision maker or as a bureaucrat or as a, as a person with some power, don't, experience the downside of the decision that you're making, right? So for example, uh, I think the migrant crisis is a very, very powerful uh, instantiation of the moral hazard, right? So many of the economic interventions or many of the policy interventions that have happened in the COVID crisis have come from the fact that the people in Delhi or in the state capitals who are making policy decisions are not the people who are facing the downside of the uh, lockdowns, the shutdowns, and any number of other interventions. Um, most um, 
powerfully it might be that you know somebody at the top level of a company who says i'm going to downsize i'm going to fire 10000 people uh, but never the but in fact whose moral hazard might be the exact opposite that their uh, paycheck themselves might be tied to the increase in stock value that comes from the downsizing and so what you have is misaligned uh, incentives on the two sides and this is very very common and of course um there are related mental models of the kind you know with information asymmetry and conflicts of interest externalities so i i won't take you through them but the basic idea is that um you see the world in a certain way so to, just to align the previous one the confirmation bias and the moral hazard um if your um interests um make you look in a certain direction you may impose a hazard on other people because your bias is um structurally aligned in one direction while their interests and their needs are structurally aligned in the opposite direction right and the classic of course uh, conflict is between labor and capital okay so now i'm going to move towards frames so a framing is when we impose a certain view of the world so it's we are not getting that view from the world we are saying we want to impose something and perhaps the most influential version of that is what's called an overton window right so at any given time there are certain things that are considered normal and there are certain other views that are considered uh, as you say ridiculous or radical in one direction um or ridiculous or radical in the other direction right so for example today uh, I, i keep using the terms climate change all the time so uh, today the normal is to use fossil fuels Uh, and to burn fossil fuels for transport for energy for almost everything we do a ridiculous view would be to say stop all fossil fuel usage today and a radical view would be to say um price carbon uh, at say three times the amount that we are doing today and um the overton window changes because what become what was radical before becomes normal today right and so in 5 or 10 years if uh, pricing carbon at 3 to 4 times today's pricing becomes the new normal then of course getting rid of uh, carbon altogether won't be seen as ridiculous and that's what many 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 people are hoping to see in the next uh, decade or two and of course the size of the window um can I shrink or expand right the second um uh, frame is what i call a veil of ignorance so this is a thought experiment uh that was um first articulated by the american philosopher john rawls uh, so he, what he said is assuming that you're trying to create a fair society now that could be at the scale of a nation that could just be a scale of one organization the question is how to do it if i if we had to choose a policy that works for everybody what is the method through which we frame that creation of the policy itself and so the veil of ignorance basically says if we are collectively in a room we put on a veil that denies us any access to our own selves so it's not um lack of knowledge of the room or lack of knowledge of others it's a lack of knowledge of ourselves it's like a deliberate blindness to oneself so um in an indian context it could be that if you are in a room um you enact your policies from the perspective that you don't know which caste you're from or you don't know which gender you're from or religion you're from and then um you may take a different view on what will work for you rather than um than what you're doing today right so for example an upper caste person in india maybe may have a gut instinct may have a confirmation bias to use uh what i just said before to think about the world in a certain way but if uh, in the process of enacting a new policy you don't know what caste you're going to be from you would hopefully think a little bit differently from what you were thinking a few minutes ago so uh, this is a very powerful framing because uh, for two reasons one it 
it actually looks at the power of ignorance in certain situations, right? So not knowing can be a very powerful uh, principle of justice. And the second is that um, it actually uh, goes in the direction of creating new policies because um, it gives you a technique rather than just a uh, principle. And, um, and if you do it in a room as I have done on occasion, um, it leads to very, very interesting uh, experimental situations that can have value within organizations and uh, larger communities. So this is where we stand. Um, we have uh, about half an hour through our uh, session right now. I do want to leave uh, time for questions. So what I want to do is to say, okay, here we have these models. We have used them. We have a sense for how to use our minds slightly more wickedly than we were before. Uh, it takes, you know, it'll take at least three to four days of sort of intense immersion in these models to uh, entrench them in, in your minds, but just uh, hopefully take it on faith from me that it's a useful tool. Nothing more than that. It's not some profound realization. It's just a useful tool for, uh, for making ourselves a little bit more wicked. Now, what I want to do is to say, okay, you have these tools. Can we assemble the wicked mind out of these tools? Okay. So um, I just want to give a <clears throat> brief view of one problem that we all would consider to be a wicked governance problem, right? Which is the uh, abysmal status of uh, gender relations in India. And you can see that whether however you do the ranking, we don't do well. And um, this is a problem that occurs at many, many scales. So there's the view of gender uh, at the level of the family, at the level of say the community or caste, and there's the uh, much larger scale of the nation as a whole. And at each scale, gender dynamics manifest in different ways, right? So in a family setting, it might be about the relative resources that um, boys and girls get. At the level of community, it may be the level of agency that a person of the male gender and a person of the female gender um, are seen as uh, being given by right by the community. Then of course, at the level of the nation, you might have um, massive um, demographic imbalances. So we know that in India, there are probably about 30 million, maybe more extra men and, um, and there's very good evidence that any society which has that kind of oversupply of men um, has tendencies towards violence. Uh, we see that sort of quite well reflected in the kind of uh, public acts of violence that we are seeing today um, and its correlation with uh, demographic imbalances, right? So gender violence seems to be um, very, very deeply tied at the macro level to individual choices at the family level. So how do we, um, what are the good models that might help us address something like this? Okay, so what I mean is therefore, how do we govern gender across scales? So what I would love is uh, maybe some suggestions in the chat window or the Q and A uh, tab over there. Uh, if you can, if you want to put some there, then um, in the in the question session we can take those up, right? But what I want to reiterate here is that the problem of gender is a wicked problem, precisely because it's not tied to a single scale, right? So scale is a dimension in which wicked problems become wicked, because they are there at the uh, uh, micro scale of the individual and the family at the medium scale of the community. And then of course, the macro scales of state, nation, world, right? And climate change is a great example of another uh, multi-scale problem because it happens, um, it will impact your individual life. It will impact the life of your neighborhood. It will impact the life of the nation and of the world. And so how, so how do we address uh, multi-scale problems is one of the basic questions of 
being a wicked mind. So this is, so what I want to leave you with is as a kind of a homework, uh, which maybe we can start addressing in the uh, Q&A session, as in how do we um, understand the links between different scales in which a wicked problem manifests, right? And one solution to it, uh, which I like a lot, is uh, a way of looking at wicked problems, a way of looking at complexity that comes from uh, an architect named uh, Christopher Alexander. So Christopher Alexander um, is a, not as well known as an architect, but is very, very influential as a theorist. And he has this book called uh, Pattern Language, which has influenced not just architecture, but also software engineering, many of the technical disciplines that uh, I keep an eye on. And um, what he says is that the same problems, but with small twists, emerge again and again in different situations. Uh, a good example of that, right, uh, are these interface patterns. So, um, Everybody has to, you know, if you're building a house, you need a door and you need a fence. So there's a threshold pattern. Uh, whatever you do, you need a way for people to cross a threshold, whether it's a fence, whether it's a, in the case of a nation, whether it's a, a immigration, whether it is citizenship, um, or if you're building an app, you know, how do you get people to sign into the app and sign out of the app, right? And so, uh, that interface pattern is something that recurs again and again in a range of problems. And what uh, Alexander and others are pointing out is this is a human universal. It's like the way we are built. The way we are built, we always have to solve this problem. The scale pattern um, is something that we um, just discussed in the or rather I just discussed in the discussion of gender, that many, many problems reoccur at multiple scales. And the only way to address them is by looking at how the scales connect to each other. And then finally, I want to come to the platform patterns. So what I mean is that we now, because we are in a so-called cybernetic age, uh, many of the things that we're building are platforms. Uh, in India, the perhaps the most prominent uh, example of that is Aadhaar, right? Where we have a single platform that's trying to unify uh, the state's understanding of its citizens, for better or worse. Um, I will not uh, say what my views are on the topic, but uh, by design, it's meant to be a single source of truth about all our citizens. Right? And so when you try to design a platform like that, uh, which has never been done before in human history, uh, you suddenly um, face a kind of problem that, um, what I say back to the Buddha, right? Which is that if you are a prince from the fifth century BC and you see all this suffering around you, um, it would have been the most natural thing then to say, okay, I can't solve this problem inside my uh, little prince, princely state. I have to go out somewhere else and figure out how to do it. And then I'll come back and tell people what the answer is, right? We can't do that today, um, unfortunately. Like the way that platforms are built, they're universal, right? So there's no going outside the little bubble that you're in. In fact, uh, all bubbles are, uh, unified in one single platform. And so we can't, so we can't solve the problem the Buddha way. So then the question is, how do we do it? So one possible answer is to create a kind of a modularity, right? So um, in, so suppose that you are Amazon and you are trying to build a software system for selling stuff to your customers directly. But at the same time, you're also trying to onboard marketplace sellers who will sell their versions of exactly the same goods to the same customers, right? And there's a very basic question. How do you prevent Amazon from competing against its own marketplace customers? And so the way they might solve that problem is by saying, we will create a software architecture in which the data that is uh, available to our marketplace customers will not be available by design to 
our own internal marketing teams. And this is a kind of software design that they claim that they're doing. There's lots of evidence that perhaps Amazon isn't strictly following those uh, uh, firewalls. But in the platform design, you may put in a pattern that puts a uh, modularity in it, right? And the example of Ariane that I um, mentioned at the beginning of this session um, is that example, right? As a society, we may say that the warrior class and uh, its battles for power and supremacy are insulated from the agricultural class so that people can go and continue to grow their food and supply um, nutrition to the rest of society without having to worry about, um, is the fighting going to destroy my world? And um, so uh, this kind of modularity is a very good, I think, way to build platforms. Um, there's of course a lot of question in India whether um, that modularity is there in the Aadhaar system. So the architects of Aadhaar say that um, firewalls are structurally built in, the critics say that they are not. Okay, so now I'm gonna end with some final um, utopian thoughts and then we can have Q&A, right? Um, I started by saying, um, you know, we take, governance for granted. But actually, um, all many of the rules that uh, we just, you know, you go into a voting booth and you vote. And it's, um, it's anonymous voting, and it is uh, universal. These are not, these didn't come from heaven. These are rules that were actually thought of by um, mathematicians in some cases and philosophers in other cases uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Right. And so what is today's gut instinct for all of us was uh, slow learning 200 years ago. So the question is, what is our slow learning for today? Right. We are in a much more complex world than we were 200 years ago. Um, we have interconnected economies and societies so that, uh, and the COVID crisis is a great example, where something that happened in the Eastern seaboard of China uh, less than a year ago is everybody's problem today, right? So how, what is the kind of uh, combination of technical understanding and social understanding that might be useful in solving these kinds of problems? Um, so one thought I have here is that whatever systems we build must be designed for trust and they must be designed for trust architecturally. Um, a famous uh, perhaps infamous case right now is that of Bitcoin and blockchains, right? Where people are saying that we have to build software systems where trust is baked into it. Um, and I mean, there's a huge amount of hype around blockchains, but I think there's a very important architectural principle in it, which is that I can um, be part of a distributed system in which transactions take place, whether they are economic or political and whatnot, without me having to know the person or even uh, trust that that person is uh, going to be a reliable partner. It's the, uh, the grammar and the architecture of the system that enforces trust rather than the uh, individual minds and behaviors of people. And that I think is a very powerful uh, systemic principle in my view. Right. The second that I would like to be able to say, and this goes back to um, Hamaya's introduction of Socrates, is that we need to design our systems around citizens rather than the state. Um, and the reason I say that is not just for the usual decentralization and democratic, uh, democratic uh, impulses that many of us might have, but also because the citizens are on the ground in the way that the state always isn't. So. Um, one of the things that I noticed was how at the beginning of the COVID crisis, there was such wonderful self-organization of citizen groups where they um, were able to deliver goods and services, uh, certainly in Bangalore, but also perhaps in other parts of the world, uh, of India, um, in a way that uh, the state wasn't able to. And so that kind of empowering of citizen learning and the capacity to respond adaptively 
I, I think would be a great new governance principle for us to have. So these are, of course, utopian thoughts. Um, and um, I will end with uh, this little cute picture. Thank you.